Uh, my name is Bill Adams. I'm the, the head of the Department of Geography. I'm very pleased to uh, welcome you all to the, to the department. Uh, the seminars are organised by the Cambridge Conservation Research Institute um, and supported by the CCI uh, Strategic Fund. You'll get a lot of acronyms in conservation in Cambridge. Um, more interestingly, um, today's speaker, uh, Professor Johan Rockström, is Professor of Environmental Science at Stockholm University and Executive Director of the Stockholm Resilience Centre. Now, he is the Humanitas Visiting Professor in Sustainability Studies, which is co-hosted by the University's Conservation Research Institute and CRASH, the Centre for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities. And Humanitas is a series of visiting professorships at Oxford and Cambridge that brings practitioners and scholars in uh, to address major themes. And it's managed by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue and in Cambridge by CRASH. And obviously we're very grateful to them for bringing uh, Johan over, and to the donor, the Tellus Matter Foundation. Johan is, uh, has a huge um, international reputation as a scientist in the field of global sustainability. He's had a, an enormously distinguished uh, career, especially in the field of water resources, and his list of honours and responsibilities is huge. I'm not going to mention them all. He's probably best known for his paper in Nature in 2009 on planetary boundaries, written with over 20 uh, other scientists. It's been one of the most talked about contributions in the field of global environmental change and global sustainability. And the planetary boundaries framework continues to shape and influence thinking about sustainability, not least in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And that's what he's going to speak about tonight. Let me remind you of something about the format. Johan will speak for 40 or 45 minutes. We'll then take some questions. We will stop sharp. Uh, on six. I know some of you will need to leave before six. Uh, if you can leave as Johan finishes speaking, that would be good, so you're not trickling out as the questions come in. I know as a speaker, it's always depressing <coughs> when people listen to the questions and then, and then leave after the first question. You think, okay, that wasn't that interesting then. So uh, if, you, if you're going to have to leave, maybe you could leave then. Um, but uh, uh, otherwise, we'll say, and, and I'll, as well as I can, I'll stop everything at six. Many of you will have heard Johan uh, speak <coughs> already. He spoke yesterday in the Lady Mitchell Hall on pathways towards global sustainability. It was uh, a fantastic lecture, uh, an amazing review of the opportunities and challenges of global change. And tonight we have, I suppose, the next instalment. Johan's subject is close to the heart of the issue for any conservationist. Planetary Boundaries 2.0, defining a safe operating space for humanity on Earth. I'd ask you to welcome Professor Johan Rockström. Thank you so much, Bill. And it's a great honor to be giving this uh, Humanitas lecture here at the Department of Geography uh, tonight. What I'll be doing in the next 45 minutes is, uh, is a scientific update of what's happened since 2009 and where we are right now. In fact, we are at the tail end of the review of what we internally call the Planet Boundary 2.0. So that's where I will kind of maintain and, and focus this, this lecture. But I think it's important at least to start to just remind ourselves of the justification behind what led to the proposition that we now must seriously as scientists consider the equilibrium state of the planet and that we must therefore consider the challenges in redefining our development paradigm from a paradigm where we've largely had economic growth as our goal and reducing environmental impacts as one of our sustainable development aims to a paradigm of world development or prosperity or growth within the bounds of a resilient and stable Earth system. And I would argue that the very step into this new realm is the recognition that we are today navigating a whole new era where we as humans are a quasi-geological force of change at the planetary scale. The suggestion by Nobel Prize laureate Paul Crutzen that we've even entered a whole new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. And three characteristics of this, which is so well familiar, of course, in, in this room, it's a planet under pressure from a dominant species that today have gone to scale in terms of pressures on the planet, that we see the tendencies of rising social environmental turbulence, interactions that are now affecting human livelihoods in different places of our planet, 
and that we can no longer exclude Earth system thresholds, which means that human-induced changes can now at a large scale induce abrupt and potentially irreversible changes that can undermine our development trajectories in the future, which I will argue requires us to define a whole new area of research in Earth resilience. Now, the, the steps into this is, number one, of course, the evidence of the hockey stick patterns of rising pressure, which comes from observation, from carbon dioxide, but also essentially all the biophysical or biogeochemical processes that we have influenced that matter from human well-being, from biodiversity loss, deforestation, eutrophication, air pollution. You can pick basically what parameter you want. You have the same pattern of pattern of change over the past 50 years, entering an exponential rise in pressures. That's one element behind addressing this new dimension of Earth system science. I might have to use the, it might, oh, I'll have to stand very close to the computer here apparently. The second is the advancements in the research showing that the reactions or the feedbacks of this increased pressure is characterized by chaotic, unexpected social ecological interactions that we no longer can just focus on climate impacts on a certain area of the economy or ecosystem response or health response but in fact that ecosystems health society economics interact in new and profoundly surprising ways and that this is increasingly entering the scientific literature and finally then that the evidence of earth system tipping points or earth elements earth tipping elements or thresholds or regime shifts is something that we also start finding increasingly evidence from in peer-reviewed literature and summarized for example here in the famous tipping elements map in terms of human induced potential tipping points due to climate change. We see increasingly, and this I brought here just because it's recently published in Cambridge University Press, of course, a, a summary of water related thresholds that we may see, namely the, the recognition that it's not only climate-induced nonlinear changes in the Earth system, but that climate interacts, for example, with the way we manage forests that can change moisture feedback, which in turn can change convective rainfall patterns having influence at the large basin or regional scale. So this is a, a truly, uh, let's say, when you put it together, the pressures, the nonlinear dynamics and interactions in social ecological dynamics, I would argue a, a new area of research in the globalized phase of development. Uh, we were surprised among the co-authorship group that developed the planetary boundary research that there's even rising evidence that even biodiversity could be associated with large-scale planetary shifts or planetary tipping points. So I think it's fair to say that um, something that has been building up for 30 years in terms of evidence on pressures, on interactions and thresholds is now becoming more and more empirically confirmed and increasingly robust in terms of scientific evidence. And that is one starting point to, to this uh, work. Um, we at the Resilience Center took upon ourselves on behalf of the Resilience Alliance, which is a network of academic institutions in the world doing resilience research, to host something that is today called the Regime Shifts Database. So if you're interested to enter the empirical evidence around nonlinear dynamics and state shifts, systems moving from one equilibrium to another, when feedbacks change direction due to pressures related to social ecological interactions, you'll find a whole battery of evidence ranging from wetlands, lakes, forest systems, all the way to the risks of shifts in the large biomes, such as ice sheets to coral reef systems. So I think you could argue that this is becoming an increasingly well-founded scientific area, which is so important to emphasize because it does fundamentally change our trajectories in economics because our economic paradigm builds on the assumption that this does not exist. Actually, as soon as you acknowledge the risk of nonlinear abrupt catastrophic changes, the whole idea of a discount rate, rate doesn't work any longer. The whole idea of cost-benefit analysis doesn't work any longer because all assumptions in economics assume linear, incremental, and therefore predictable changes that you can cost or that you can value long time in the future. So in summary, this is basically the, the, the foundational part of the planetary boundary science. The steps from when we change states in, in ecosystems, the assumption that we've always lived under that things change linearly and incrementally, 
which does occur in, in for example, very anthropogenically dominated farming systems in many cases, but recognizing that many systems rather have a threshold behavior shown in the second graph and even hysteresis shown in the third graph, meaning that once you change state, feedbacks and interactions change to a point where it's much, much more expensive or difficult to return to the original state than the efforts it took to push yourselves across an undesired threshold. And that we have a lot of empirical evidence of these state shifts from savanna to bush step, from rainforest to savanna, from coral dominated to soft coral dominated systems. We've been doing a lot of explanations deep down in the ecology of such shifts and, and, and this room certainly filled up with other experiences. This is just one example among many from the Baltic Sea showing the importance, I should backtrack to say that 1989 we know with quite good certainty that the Baltic Sea flipped over from a cod rich, oxygen rich, nutrient poor state a desired state for ecosystem services to what you see on the picture here, which is frequent algal bloom in a totally anoxic inner sea. And that the reason for this was not, as was always thought, only eutrophication of nutrient load from agriculture, but in fact the very, very dramatic 90% fish down of the top predator cod led to a dramatic explosion of herring, the second tier level mesopredator which led to an enormous over um, exploitation of zooplankton, which meant that you got an explosion in phytoplankton, which was of course fed up by nitrogen and phosphorus overload from agriculture, which led to an enormous growth of phytoplankton with decomposed and consumed all oxygen, and you entered a virtuous cycle, which has led to this dead state in the Baltic Sea. And this has only been understood very recently because all the trends show a remarkable success in reducing nutrient load among the Baltic states. So you would have expected the sea to recover. But in fact, it has gotten so locked into this undesired state that it sits there firmly even despite very, very good reductions in environmental impacts. So it just is one example of the need to navigate a different type of governance, meaning that you cannot optimize just reducing environmental impacts, but you need to actually step away from thresholds and navigate safe operating space across different scales in, in how we manage things. Now, now it worked overly good. Um, so that takes us to the whole concept on resilience and uh, we have been pursuing this as one element of theory within sustainability science. It's just one component of sustainable development. Uh, we define today resilience in three different dimensions, and I just mentioned that, so it's kind of on the record that the original theory around resilience focused very much on persistency or robustness or the ability of a system to take a shock without tipping over into a, another state. And, and I will, through this lecture, argue that at the planetary scale, persistency is the dimension of resilience that is our top preoccupation. The risk of the Earth system changing its equilibrium. But we today include the capacity to adapt to changing conditions as a second very important characteristics of resilience. And thirdly, if a system tips over into a crisis, be it a financial system or a farming system, what's the elements in such a system from networks to capital to ecological functions that can help such a system to transform into a new trajectory, to lift itself out of its undesired state. Now, of course, there is still scientific debate around the evidence related to tipping points or regime shifts. Um, recently, we had one such debate between um, a group of scientists led by Barry Brook questioning the whole notion of biosphere-related tipping points, and a response was summarized by a group that was part of the planetary boundary research in, in a paper led by Terry Hughes. So of course this is, and I just want to acknowledge that, that this is still in the scientific debate sphere. But I would still argue that the, the more interesting question is this one, rather. So rather debating whether or not we have nonlinear dynamics and social ecological systems across scales, I think truly the big challenge is what happens when you combine the insights of the pressures in the Anthropocene with the evidence that catastrophic regime shifts seem to be in fact something we observe in the real world of, of the Anthropocene. 
And that is what we took as a starting point for the planetary boundary analysis. We put for the first time, and, and resilient scientists tend to use this cup and bowl diagram to put ecosystems in one stable domain to illustrate that that's one stable equilibrium and if that cup gets more shallow, the system gets more prone to a trigger that could push it across the threshold to another state. We said, do we now need to put the Earth system as a whole in this cup? And then two, three questions arise, which forms the theoretical foundation of the planetary boundary framework. The first one is, can we define the desired state of the planet to support human well-being? Question one. Question two is, if we could do that, can we identify the Earth system processes that regulates that stability? Basically, defining Earth resilience. And can we, as a third and final question, if we can identify those Earth system processes, can we even, from the evidence around nonlinear changes, define a boundary along a control variable that would allow ourselves to identify a point beyond which we enter a zone where the likelihood of nonlinear changes increases very drastically. And that is, in a nutshell, what the planetary boundary framework did. Now, on the first question, I would argue we can answer what is the desired state of the Earth system. Even this is still a scientifically debated question. But I think there's a lot of evidence today to suggest that the Holocene state, our interglacial period where we've been for the past 10,000 years, has unique properties as the only state we know of the Earth system that can support the modern world as we know it. This is a graph from Greenland showing the past 100,000 years of temperature variability in the Earth system on the y-axis, showing the remarkable flip up and down with temperatures ranging from a remarkable plus minus 10 to 15 degrees Celsius over periods of decades, showing that this was a period of remarkable huge variability. And we were modern humans during this entire period, and it's not until we exit this point where we transition from hunters and gatherers, 2 to 40 million people on the planet, to become sedentary farmers, inventing agriculture, and off we go in the civilizational journey that we all know so well. And, and this is very difficult to explain, this success story of our civilizational journey without factoring in the remarkable stability of the Holocene. The fact that the Holocene has a maximum temperature variability of plus minus one degree. The remarkable evidence that the global hydrological cycle remains relatively stable right through this period. And the remarkable evidence that the big biomes as we know them have genetically had their source variability existing for hundreds of millions of years often, but that it's in the Holocene they all established themselves in the natural capital that we have exploited to build the modern societies as, as we know them. So our starting point, which is of course a, a provocative scientific suggestion, is that the Holocene is the only equilibrium state of the Earth system that we know can support the modern world as we know it. So it's an ethical statement to say that if we're serious about feeding and catering for human well-being for 9 to 10 billion people by mid-century, we have very large difficulties in seeing how that can occur outside of the Holocene. Now that then resulted in, in the Planetary Boundary Framework, which was published in 2009. It was actually a challenge to science. It was filled up with a lot of uh, even best guesses in terms of the quantification of the boundaries. But we felt that we had so much not only evidence behind us in terms of both the Anthropocene, thresholds and understanding of the Earth system, but also building on, on a very, very large mountain of Earth system science advancements in the past 30 years. Remember, for example, that the synthesis around the Anthropocene comes out for the first time in 2007, published by the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, which I think is a seminal example of our deep, deep understanding today of the complex, self-regulating, integrated Earth system. So we dared put this forward as a scientific challenge. The robust research here, I would argue, was the identification of the nine planetary boundary processes. We actually felt quite, quite um, um, convinced based on the methodology we chose, which was a consultation over three years with a number of Earth system scientists to understand better what are the different processes that regulate the stability in the Earth system. 
So we felt quite confident that the climate system, the stratospheric ozone layer, ocean acidification, showing proof of planetary scale tipping points in the paleo record, clearly are candidates for planetary boundaries. But we also felt that we know enough today to say that the biosphere and the stability of the biosphere plays a critical role in regulating the resilience of the Earth system, which includes the two large cycles of nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. It includes land use, how we configure the terrestrial ecosystems on Earth, how we manage biodiversity, and how we manage the global hydrological cycle. A little bit more surprising, perhaps, was to include aerosol loading, but we felt that aerosol loading today, which includes all the, the soot and black carbon particles that today, for example, show very clear evidence of affecting large-scale rainfall systems, for example, the Asian brown cloud, can be considered to be something that can provide and cause feedbacks, both in the climate system, but also in the global hydrological cycle. And finally, the dark horse on chemical pollution. Is it so that the aggregation of human-created chemical compounds could, in fact, aggregate to a point where suddenly it could affect, for example, our own genetic composition? And we put that forward as a proposition, that this is probably one candidate among those that regulate the stability of our own future on Earth. Now, the definitions of the boundaries, on the other hand, was much tougher. We proposed quantifications for seven of the nine, saying that for aerosols and chemicals we don't have enough scientific evidence to propose boundaries. And I would also like to say that already in 2009 we were very clear that for climate change, for ozone, and for ocean acidification, we felt that there was ample scientific evidence to propose a boundary level, but much, much more uncertain with regards to land, biodiversity, fresh water, but also the nitrogen phosphorus cycles. And that was clear right in the publication. We've been criticized a lot for, for, you know, as soon as you put a number, it's shot down very effectively by those who feel that either it's impossible to put a number or that it's the wrong number. But we were clear that this was a way to challenge science. And I think we were quite successful because since its publication, there's been 62 peer-reviewed scientific articles published directly related to this paper with 933 scientific citations after that point. So I think that's in itself what we wanted to achieve to trigger that, that research. Um, I just want to very quickly say that it, it really builds on the advancements in both Earth system science, the work that goes all the way back to limits to growth and carrying capacities and ecological footprinting, all the way to the advancements in ecological economics and resilience theory. So it's not as if it came from a vacuum. It really builds incrementally on the advancements of science of the past 30 years. But I also want to emphasize that it's very different to the concepts that we've come to associate, unfortunately, with planetary boundaries. It is not limits to growth. In fact, it is so significantly different that even Dennis Meadows and myself have given a talk together at Utrecht to, to make that point. Because what, what um, Dennis and Donald Meadows did in 1972 was to make the best possible estimate at the time of resource availability for few areas of resources in the Earth system. But then they made assumptions on technology and they made assumptions on human needs. And then they compared the human demand with planetary supply, and when the supply was lower than demand, there was an overshoot, and then they put algorithms of collapse associated with this mismatch, which led to conclusions related to nonlinear changes in, for example, impacts on the world economy. They made assumptions on technology and human needs. Same with carrying capacity, same with guardrails, assumptions of combining social and ecological. And the paradox is, and, and uh, I often need to explain this because I, I lead a center that prides itself of doing social ecological research, but the planetary boundary framework is definitely not social ecological. It is biophysical. It's actually, the thought experiment is, what we did was actually to think, let's take away humans for a while. Let's, let's place our seven billion people on the moon and let's look at the earth and look at the planet and scientifically just ask the question, what does it take for the earth system, irrespective of humans, to remain in a Holocene equilibrium? And that defines the processes and that defines the boundary levels. And then that can give us a safe operating space. And this safe operating space is where we put back humanity. 
But then what happens in that safe operating space is no assumption made in the planetary boundary framework. In fact, to my students at home, I often try to make the analogy that nobody would dream of playing football or soccer in a pitch where you don't have a white line that signals when the game is on and when the game is off. You even have a referee that blows the whistle when the ball goes outside of the boundary. You're not allowed to be outside of the boundary. But inside the boundary, you can play like, and I always use Slatan Ibrahimovic, of course, as the example. You can play like a virtuose football player, but you can play as loudly as myself, of course. So we make no assumptions on how good or bad you are on growth, for example. We make no assumptions on how good or bad you are on technology or whether we can feed the world. It's just trying to define this biophysical space. And then the question is, can we be innovative enough to navigate ourselves inside that space? I would argue that this is one key reason why it has resonated so much with business and the policy community. Because it clearly does not assume anything with regards, for example, to our enormous opportunity and ability to innovate. As you know, the Club of Rome work was shut down partly because it underestimated the Green Revolution, which is something that you can never really associate with the planetary boundary work. So I think that's, that's quite essential in terms of how it differs. Um, we put a lot of effort into the theory and the method development with regards to how we define a boundary in relation to the threshold. And this is also something that's been so deeply misunderstood. So, the, the boundary is placed right at the point of the lower end of what we assess to be the scientific uncertainty. And in yellow you have the uncertainty range, and somewhere inside that uncertainty range we conclude that there is a high likelihood of a threshold. But we don't know where that threshold is. But the boundary is not the point of the threshold. It's the point at the lower end of scientific uncertainty. So for example, for the climate boundary, our assessment was that somewhere in the range, we use the control variable concentration of greenhouse gases, in this case using CO2 as the proxy. We also had a climate forcing boundary, and we said that the boundary uncertainty is between 350 ppm and 550 ppm. If you look at the science, somewhere in that range, there appears to be a risk of thresholds that could have feedbacks that could irreversibly push ourselves into a state outside of the Holocene. Now, normatively, we chose to place the boundary at the lower end of that uncertainty. That is a normative choice. It is actually applying a precautionary principle in the methodology. But it's not the threshold. It's not as if the world goes under at 351 ppm. In fact, we are already now at 399 ppm. So, so that has often been accused as something that, you know, well, we know nothing about the exact point of tipping point, so you can't quantify things. But this is a way of applying a methodology of risk. The other very important part of the methodology is that not all boundaries need to have planetary evidence of planetary scale tipping points. In fact, we include on the right-hand side systems that have evidence of gradual decline in terms of how they operate but with feedbacks back to the large systems. For example, if you degrade land or deforest enough land on terrestrial ecosystems, you can have a feedback, or you certainly have a feedback, back into the climate system, reinforcing the risk of a threshold effect in the climate system. And we put the boundary there at the points beyond which we assessed that there are these risks of large-scale feedbacks on the systems that have planetary scale thresholds. But they also qualified as a planetary boundary on the following term, which is a bit complicated in, 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 in the communications of the, on the concept. For example, the risk of nutrient-induced tipping points in freshwater systems. We know this by evidence that it occurs. We have many, many, many examples around the world. But we felt that at what point of nutrient overload are we at risk of seeing such tipping points occurring in so many places simultaneously across the world in the Anthropocene that they would actually become, on aggregate, a feedback mechanism that could undermine the Holocene stability. So it's a question also of if many, many things go wrong in many, many places at the same time. Okay. Now I don't know what I did. Did I turn, uh, turn the, th I probably pressed the wrong button here. I think it's this one here that I, what? ah, good. Uh -huh. Okay, 
I'll go, I'll go past this one. So on the scientific debates then quickly, well, clearly there's been published research questioning the very notion of existence of averse system point, averse system tipping points. I think this paper is, is perhaps the best summary of that work. But you have other scientists like Stuart Pym as well uh, questioning whether there is, not only that there is, whether there are tipping points, but also making the very, very valid point that way, way, way before you reach a boundary, we have problems. <coughs> And, and this may actually lead to the wrong association that we are okay up until the point of the boundary. And I think that's a very valid criticism. Um, there's been a critique on the boundary definitions right across from the water boundary, recently published by Anos Bogardi and colleagues. Um, a very important paper by Steve Carpenter and Elna Bennett on reconsidering the phosphorus boundary. They said something very important. We included only the risk of phosphorus-induced big anoxic events in the oceans. But they said that way before you've caused an anoxic event in the ocean, you have major flips in freshwater systems upstream. So they suggested a dual definition of a freshwater phosphorus boundary and a marine phosphorus boundary, which we've now included in, in the second update. There's been very, very interesting work on advancing a downscale version of the water boundary to define the minimum amount of fresh water in every river basin in the world, building on the very, very important advancements in, in environmental water flow work, led by Dieter Gerten and, and colleagues. And then Fim de Vries critically assessed the nitrogen boundary and, and felt that we had put that at a level that did not have enough substantive support. And we certainly agree with that. And now we're updating it based on his analysis that shows that, to begin with, we only include, we, we took the boundary definition as the amount of nitrogen uh, unreactive nitrogen that is taken out from the atmosphere and transformed into reactive nitrogen in the fertilizer Haber-Bosch process. So we only include fertilizers, which is, as you may know, already today uh, interfering more than 100% compared to the global natural nitrogen cycle. But he made the point that the Earth is today so anthropogenically manipulated that even the biological nitrogen fixating in modern agriculture is a very large component. So now we've combined, combined these two, so we have all the N2 taken up, both biologically and industrially. So these are very important improvements. Uh, you have the debate going on whether we have missed out a few boundaries. Steve Running suggesting that net primary production should actually be considered a boundary. Um, and, and we've had long discussions, I talked to him latest just last week about this. We concluded in the end it's a good boundary, but it's more of an aggregate from both nitrogen, phosphorus, water, land, biodiversity. It's kind of a, uh, uh, a little sub-element of, of integrating existing boundaries. But also the critique that has been coming up, for example, this point I think is really critical, that um, there's been a, Simon Lewis wrote a piece in, in Nature recently saying that the concept is too narrow, that it doesn't distinguish between boundaries and thresholds, and that it should clarify this influence at different scales. And um, we then responded that these are actually misunderstandings. We've never claimed that the boundary is the tipping point, and we've never claimed that it only has to occur at the planetary scale. And that's also a bit surprising to me that there is still so many misconceptions around this, this framework out there. I think very few people read in the end the Ecology and Society paper, which is the better paper of the two, uh, and the longer one. Um, anyway, so this is something that we've been very strongly influenced by. Um, a lot of work on, on what this means for justice. In fact, Kate Raworth has developed this famous donut economy modeling idea, which uh, I think is, 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 I mean, so profoundly important to say, okay, if there's a biophysical thing, there must be a social floor. And how do we share in a fair way the remaining budgets of biophysical space on Earth? translated into this very interesting paper by John Deering and colleagues trying to develop a methodology for this, in fact. How do you integrate the biophysical boundaries with a social space? Um, a whole batch of papers showing that our analysis does not match up in terms of the social needs in the world. So here again, we collide with the limits of growth thinking. If we say that the boundary, or suggest that the boundary for nitrogen is 35, maximum of 35 million tons of N2 per year, can we feed the world with that amount of nitrogen? Their conclusion is no. 
And then the question is, what kind of compromises do you then do? And I think this is an incredibly healthy debate. Look at the Sustainable Development Goals, where there's today a complete, you know, incoherent set of goals, where we're going to eradicate hunger and then do that within a, a very ambitious climate goal and, and do it everything sustainably. But nobody knows at all if these things add up with current level of policy, governance, and technologies. Governance has become a very central piece of the advancements in the planetary boundary research. I could give a whole lecture on, on the great thinking from Frank Biermann's work on Earth system governance. Martin Heyer, who hit back and said, there's no, there's no cockpit on the planet. That, that it's naive to think that there would be a, a, a cockpit steering the planet in terms of planetary stewardship. Victor Galas and then colleagues going in and then trying to respond in a more Elena Ostrom's type way of combining polycentric governments from below with earth system governance from above. I think this is a fascinating area of research. Uh, there's a lot of, or increasing also research on the economics of planetary boundaries. What does that actually mean if we now incorporate the risk of unacceptable changes when we go beyond certain points of resource use? And what does this mean for business in the end? Gail Whiteman showing that, in fact, business seems to be ready to adopt this kind of thinking of constraining its business models to a certain set of quantitative sustainability criteria. And the World Business Council for Sustainable Development have actually adopted a full-fledged framework of doing so, which is quite, quite exciting. And then comes the update, which we're working on today. So this is a work in progress. It's just to say that the nine boundaries in that science stand firm, which I mentioned earlier. We have been very, very um, influenced and inspired by work by Georgina Mace and Bob Scholes and Belinda Reyes and others on improving the biodiversity boundary to include not only the rate of loss of species, we used extinction rate in the first analysis, to also combine that with functional diversity using mean species abundance, but also the new biosphere integrity index that Bob Scholes has developed, and adding the phosphorus boundary, as you see, the freshwater boundary part, but also substantially changing the land boundary, because in the first round, we were preoccupied with the question, how much of the biosphere do we need to sustain in its natural state to be able to regulate, for example, carbon sinks? But the proxy we used was cropland, because we felt we had good data on that. So it was the maximum amount of allowed cropland on Earth. But that was, of course, the wrong indicator, and it created a huge amount of debate. Well, what does that mean if we have sustainable agriculture instead of unsustainable agriculture? Doesn't that change the boundary position? So we've changed that now to define it rather of how much do we need to keep of different critical biomes that regulate on the terrestrial land surface earth resilience. And that boils down very clearly to forest systems, particularly the boreal, temperate, and the rainforest systems. So we've done that change and suggest that now in the review. So here you have the, the boundaries as they are today, and in yellow you see the, the new proposed definitions, which are now in review, I, I, should, I should emphasize. So we've actually narrowed in the boundary uncertainty range for climate based on the AR5. We think there's enough evidence to say now that already 450 ppm is the, is the upper bound beyond which we actually risk climate feedbacks that could take us irreversibly and, and self-accelerate in the wrong direction. For biodiversity, we've, as I mentioned, added functional diversity and used the Biosphere Integrity Index as a suggested boundary definition. For novel entities, which is the old chemicals pollution boundary, we're still unable to quantify boundary. For stratospheric ozone depletion, it remains the same as the previous one, the thickness of the ozone layer. Uh, ocean acidification also remains the same, the minimum amount of aragonite, uh, calcium carbonite that is required to be kept in the oceans. Big changes then in nitrogen and phosphorus, taking this approach of adding a fresh water phosphorus boundary, but also adding the, the, the biologically fixated nitrogen inside the nitrogen boundary, which raises the, the number from 35 to 44 million tons of nitrogen per year, which falls very nicely in the range of, of the published research that has been coming out since that work. And then, as I mentioned on land, transfer, transforming it rather to the minimum amount of biomes that need to be kept. For example, we estimate and propose that for tropical rainforest that we should keep an, at least an 85 percent of standing rainforest, building, for example, on Tom, Tom Lovejoy's work in, in the Amazon. Um, so this is, um, to just summarize to you, fresh water as well. Uh, importantly, then taking it down to the river basin scale. So we had consumptive freshwater use at the global scale, 
but we're now coupling it with a sister boundary at the basin level, building on, on Dieter uh, and, and their work at the Potsdam Institute, doing that for different seasons of, of flows as well, so building on the most modern ways of environmental flow methodology. And finally, for aerosol loading, proposing a boundary quantification, but a regional one, which is based on Ramanathan's work in Asia, showing that at, a, at what's the optical depth minimum in terms of solar infiltration that we need to sustain rainfall patterns in Southeast Asia. It's a, it's a proposed boundary to show that we think it can be done. Okay, so that is um, uh, quickly on, on the quantifications. I'll just run through the three boundaries quickly that have been transgressed just on the updates there. This is nothing new to you, so I don't have to spend much time. Uh, Thomas Docker, the chair at the first working group in the AR5, as you certainly saw, published quite recently his assessment that in 2023 we closed the door to two degrees and that that is clearly uh, a conservative analysis of a boundary transgression. Uh, the evidence coming out of the most late red embers diagram showing in the right hand corner the planned boundary concern of large scale singular events, basically catastrophic uh, changes, that when you compare it with the AR4 and AR3 gives a very remarkable pattern um, of, of change, which is um, quite, quite a concern, I think, for a scientist. So this is putting AR3, AR4, and AR5 next to each other, and you see the pattern by which, um, no, that doesn't come up. What you see is a pattern, the y-axis here is degrees of warming in, in from zero to five degrees, and in AR3, the assessment was that catastrophic tipping points would not be crossed until we reached four degrees, in the AR4 it was 3 degrees and the AR5 were down to 2 degrees. So clearly science is, is advancing in terms of narrowing in on the levels of warming that can be acceptable with regards to thresholds. I've gone through the nutrients. This is the paper from uh, Steve Carpenter and Ella Bennett on the phosphorus boundary, which tested for different loads of fresh water, of phosphorus loading in fresh water to oceans. What does it mean for land-based uh, thresholds? And this is the, the very important paper by Wim de Vries and colleagues on nitrogen, which we used and built upon to redefine the, the nitrogen boundary. On biodiversity, I think this work clearly has influenced us in, in creating more confidence that biodiversity really matters. The Tony Barnowski paper showing that we might even have a planetary scale biodiversity-induced tipping point with regards to genetic diversity on Earth, a very controversial paper, but clearly in the realm of what we are concerned with in the planet boundary work. The growing evidence that top predators play a critical role in cascade effects in ecosystems, that you can actually induce large-scale e ecosystem tipping points by losing top predators in ecosystems. I think that work is now very well established, in fact. We recently published, I think, a very interesting work in support of this, showing that when you gather and synthesize the work on, on bird, seabird populations across the different oceans in the world, you seem to find a rule of thumb that when we downgrade uh, fisheries with roughly 30% of fish populations, you start seeing collapse of seabird populations. And it seems to be a universal number that 30% of fish lost leads to the risk of tipping points in, in seabird populations. Interactions among boundaries are, are well established. The Global Carbon Project just released its latest report showing that the biosphere continues to be our best friend in terms of buffering our emissions of greenhouse gases. A remarkable 55% of our CO2 emissions continues to be taken up by the biosphere, more than a doubling in 50 years, showing again that the planetary boundary processes not only interact, but I think provides evidence that in fact it is an integrated system where we need to be as concerned with biodiversity and land as we are with emission of greenhouse gases. But also these kind of studies that are now more and more kind of coming out in scientific literature, and, and to me this is always a, a shocking graph to put on, uh, on, on the table. This shows the regions in the world in red that depend to 80% or more for the rainfall on moisture feedback from neighboring countries' forests. Meaning that, for example, the stability of the Chinese economic future depends to a large extent on Russia, Ukraine, all the way to the Baltic states, ability to sustainably manage their forests. Meaning that we've underestimated the importance of moisture feedback from terrestrial ecosystems. Same goes for Latin America and large parts of Central Africa. This is one 
kind of reminder of how interwoven the planetary boundary processes are across scales. We've been working very actively with downscaling the boundaries. And I'll just go through this very quickly. It's quite exciting to see that we now can, uh, um, yeah, now it's not, ah, oh, it is responding, okay. On, on ocean acidification, um, how there's increasing data to show how the spatial distribution across different futures are in terms of red transgression, yellow uncertainty zone, and green in a safe operating space. Same for biosphere integrity with the work of PBL and the image modeling group in the Netherlands, showing the regions where we are transgressing and the regions where we're still in a safe operating space. I mentioned this for um, phosphorus and also nitrogen, which can now be modeled and mapped, which creates something quite interesting because it shows that if we want to operate within a safe nitrogen budget, you can find where are the regions where we are today overusing nitrogen and where are the regions where we actually are under using nitrogen and the possibility therefore to, to address this whole issue of, of justice within a safe operating space. And similarly with regards to where are the basins in the world where we're overdrafting fresh water in terms of sustaining resilience at the regional scale. So that's also in that second paper. Um, there's a lot of downscaling work done nationally, as you may be aware. This is a study to take the planetary boundaries down to a national scale in Sweden. It's now being done also in Switzerland. This great work of John Deering to actually try to develop a safe operating space and a just distribution of that space. I think this could be a start of a very interesting integrating modeling work. But also a number of civil society organizations, this in, in Europe, trying to apply this for European policy. What does it mean? if we take the boundaries, quantify them, and try to integrate them into European environmental policy. And then finally, on, on navigating the governance side. Um, this, I think, is a incredibly important for us to start addressing the bottom-up versus top-down in terms of governance. How far can polycentric governance structures go, and how much do we need to have top-level Earth system steering of a future where we are clearly, I would argue, at risk of having unwanted feedbacks. Uh, technology and innovation is increasingly being in attention in planetary boundaries as well to say if we would define planetary boundaries, is that an incentive or does it hamper technology innovation? We're doing quite some exciting work with the Singularity University. You may have read uh, Diamandi's work on abundance where the conclusion is we're now entering the second machine age, as you know. We have exponential growth of technologies. We will be able to cater for abundance for everyone in the world. But will that actually be possible inside a safe operating space? And Victor Galas at the Resilience Center has led a, a book that's recently published in, in this area. Um, Unzi Biggs and, and colleagues at the center are also exploring what are the elements that then need to be in place in terms of social capacities to address um, resilience building in, in the Anthropocene? And that's another very important area of, of research. And then to, to close this briefly, just, to, just a kind of a, a provocative challenge. What does this mean for economics? And of course, it, it profoundly changes the way we think about economics. But one very simple way to think of it, which would be interesting to discuss, is the following, that if we now believe that Plenty boundaries does not hinder growth, that in fact you could have growth within a safe operating space, what we've played around with to call a planetary souffle model, which could collapse quite easily if we don't deal with it very carefully. The question is how this could work. And we took then the most um, uh, criticized conventional climate economics model, DICE, led by uh, Bob Nordhaus. And, and you've all seen this graph, how the world develops up until 2100, GDP growth, a world economy reaching 500 trillion US dollars by end of century, and the fact that business as usual barely differs from a 450 ppm future. In fact, there are only a few years of delay, and it shows that it is actually, one, quite cheap to move towards a 450 ppm future, but also that business as usual has very little impacts back on the economy. But if you take exactly this data and instead plot it in the following way, having not time on the x-axis, but growth in the economy, which is a kind of a time axis, because the year 2100 is actually right here in 500 trillion uh, US dollars. But on the y-axis, you have carbon dioxide concentration. So the business as usual trajectory follows the blue line, goes up to 900 ppm. But the two degree limit in DICE reaches 550 ppm, and then you have the 450 ppm trajectory in green, the desired one. Now, if you then load planetary boundaries upon this, you actually end up showing that 
the science indicates that the 5% probability of exceeding 4 degrees is the blue line, and the 5% probability of exceeding 6 degrees is the upper line. Now, let's just assume for a while that the 6 degree 5% probability is a boundary beyond which we cannot accept to go, which I would argue every citizen on Earth would agree. Nobody wants to go beyond 6 degrees. That means that this is the end point of conventional economic growth. You cannot go beyond that point. In fact, what happens is that that becomes the break point between below that line where conventional economics can apply. You can actually do discounting and cost-benefit and operate your conventional macroeconomic theories and policies in full. But beyond that point, you're actually in the realm of ethics. You enter the realm where economics collapse, where you simply need to apply a different kind of thinking. And that is quite releasing in terms of the error I think we do today because we tend to have infights between different types of economists. But this would suggest that conventional economics is great up to that point, but beyond that point we're actually in the realm of something else. And I'm closing here, I see Bill's eyes on, on the watch and my own as well, just to finally say the following, that we've then applied all of this thinking together with Paul Raskin and, and his group at Telus Institute to say can we actually transition the world into a safe operating space in the future. And we've done the first run, trying to load all the boundaries and all the technologies and everything we know, and to ask ourselves, can we actually transition into the upper space there, or what happens if we go to a conventional development? And not surprisingly, conventional development pushes ourselves on all boundaries way outside of a safe operating space. But the results and, and, and the, the efforts of moving up to the desired green circle took not only technology, it took deep changes in lifestyles in this model exercise. It was impossible to achieve unless we kind of reconnected our society to the biosphere, had the deep mind shift of what we value in life, and the ability to share with all coast citizens on Earth. So just to end to say that I think there's a lot of evidence to say that it can be done. We can transition into a safe operating space. I think there's no evidence to suggest that we cannot have a thriving human enterprise within a safe operating space. I think the dichotomy between growth and planetary boundaries is a false one. But certainly, it's such a deep transformation, it will require much, much more integrated science between philosophy, history, culture, economics, and natural sciences. And I think, in my mind, the geography thinkers in the world are at a pool position to spearhead that work. Thank you very much. <laughs>